Ladies and gentlemen, boils and ghouls, it's the greatest time of the year. Spooky season is here again, and I couldn't be happier because I love Halloween. Every year we dedicate a chunk of this channel to talking about monsters, ghosts, goblins. If it goes bump in the night, we're going to spotlight it. But we also love fighting games on this channel. And if you love monsters and you love fighting games, then right there where that Venn diagram meets, you're going to find Darkstalkers. It's pretty much the king of horror-themed fighting games. When you think of fighting game monsters, Morgan, Felicia, Dimitri, John Talbain, and all the other Night Warriors instantly come to mind. But you know, I've been thinking. Just because Darkstalkers has some of the most famous fighting game monsters, does that mean it has the best fighting game monsters? There aren't too many other horror-themed fighting games out there, so has Darkstalkers been holding on to the top spot just because of a lack of competition? Well, I say let's settle this. Let's find out who really are the best monsters in fighting games. Today we're going to take five categories of classic monsters, and we're going to determine which fighting game has the best of each. So, here's how we're going to make this work. For each category, we're going to pick four fighters. Only one fighter is allowed per franchise, and only characters who originated in fighting games will be considered. We're looking for the best fighting game monster, not the best monster who appeared in a fighting game. With each monster, we're going to judge them in three categories. Lore, meaning things like their origin, their story, their personality. Presentation, which includes things like their design, their voice, basically everything outside of the actual combat itself. And lastly, gameplay, which is their moves, their animation, basically everything inside of the actual combat itself. Also, very important to point this out, gameplay doesn't mean how well they fight, or what tier they're in, or how broken they are. No, it means how well does their gameplay represent their monstrous origins. Do the werewolves play like werewolves? Do the vampires play like vampires? Stuff like that. For each of these three categories, we're going to rank the four fires from best to worst, giving them points for each spot. Then at the end, we're going to tally all those points up and figure out who are the best monsters in fighting game. Everyone ready? Let's kick things off with the king of the monsters, the vampire. Now this was a hard choice to make, Vampires are some of the most popular creatures in all of fiction, so as you can imagine, there have been a lot of bloodsuckers in fighting games. Everything from Mortal Kombat to Soul Calibur to Tekken has had a vampire in it. So getting this down to four competitors was tricky, but I think I found a selection that best represents the vampire mythos. Dimitri from Darkstalkers, Mira from Killer Instinct, Rachel Alucard from Blazeblue, and Slayer from Guilty Gear. Let's start with the lore, and we're going to go alphabetically, so we begin with Dimitri. He challenged the ruler of the Makai, the realm of demons, to try and become the ruler of all monsters, but he lost and was therefore banished to the human world where he has to live in a castle plying his revenge and just growing more ticked off with each day. So basically he's Dracula, but way more pissed off and constantly plying to take over hell. Also the fact that he uses his own powers to constantly shield his castle from the sun Mean that if you ride up to the castle, even if it's in broad daylight, it will instantly turn into night? That's just really cool. Next up is Mira, and this is a really dark tale. Mira was a member of a guild of monster hunters, but one day to save her partner Maya, she sacrificed herself to a horde of vampires. And now, Mira has joined their ranks as one of the walking undead. She's your classic cold and sinister vampire who lives to feed and draws great pleasure from it. This to me shows off one of the creepiest sides of vampires. The idea that someone close to you can get bitten, and now they're just an unholy doppelganger of their former self, twisted into something unrecognizable. So our first two contestants are showing off some really strong sides of the classic vampire mythos. But now things are about to get way more complicated as we move on to Rachel, because if you want a series out there that is the reigning champ of characters with complicated backstories, it's Blaze Blue. So okay, Super Cliff Notes version, Rachel is a member of a wealthy family of vampires, but she was chosen by some great cosmic being to be a watcher. Uh, I mean, an observer. Someone who has to sit back and observe the universe forever, including through all of its various reboots. Because of this, Rachel is the epitome of being wise beyond her years and is constantly talking like she knows more than everyone else, because she does and she leans heavily into being ominous and condescending with every line she delivers, which really sells her immortal status. And lastly, Slayer, who comes from Guilty Gear, 
the only other series out there that could possibly beat Blaze Blue for complicated backstories. Again, going with the Super Cliff Notes version here, Slayer is a vampire who hundreds of years ago established an assassin's guild, but after years of being away, he returned to the guild to find it had now devolved into a mess, so he took it over again and said that now it would be guided by one principle, dandyism. Now I love Slayer and his whole dandyism angle, but that doesn't really mean much for the vampire angle. However, we're also judging personalities here, and Slayer's personality is great. He's also immortal like Rachel, and he knows that nothing can kill him. So when he loses a match or he gets hit, he doesn't care. He just shrugs that right off. Heck, he's the only character in the game who doesn't care when you perform an instant kill on him, because how can you instant kill the unkillable? So whose lore is the most vampiric? Well, in last place, I'm going with Rachel. I think her personality is great for an immortal wealthy vampire, but beyond that, her story is more focused on big cosmic nuttiness and less on being a creature of the night. Then next up is Slayer. Again, love his personality. A vampire who has been around, he's seen the world, he's well educated from all of his travels, and he knows that nothing can hurt him. It's a fun take on the vampire character. And being an assassin is a dark profession that I could see a vampire having. But now we get into the top two, and in second place, I'm going with Dimitri. As I said, he's the souped up anime version of Dracula. They take everything about the Dracula mythos and then power it up to level 9000 but I still have to declare Mira the winner. I think part of the appeal of a vampire and why they're so scary is the idea that a loved one can become twisted into these crazed bloodsuckers, and Mira nails that in her backstory. So, now that we know who these fighters are, let's take a look at their presentation. Again, we're going to start with Dimitri, who, as I said before, he's just Dracula. If you inflated Dracula with an air pump and then gave him Vegeta hair, but hey, that's just fine. It does the job. You look at this guy and you think vampire. But I still feel like they could have made him a bit more unique, especially considering some of his crazy earlier designs. Although I will say, I do really love that they animated this unholy energy constantly irradiating off of him. That had to have taken so much work back in the day. Now Mira, on the other hand, she's got a great mix of classic vampire elements, such as the white skin, the bright red lips, and I do love that red scarf, that's a great color choice to accentuate the theme of blood. And each of these fighters do have red in their design, but it contrasts so well here with Mira's pale, ghoulish skin. It makes both the white and red colors pop out so much. But she's also decked out in spiked gothic looking armor, which makes her feel like she's ready to fight, and the clawed gloves really play into the more beastly side of vampires. Now, moving on to something completely different, Rachel Alucard. When you look at her the first time, you'll notice that she is rather... short. Yeah, Rachel appears to be just a child, but that actually plays into the vampire theme as well. Vampires are immortal after all, and there are so many stories about vampires who remain young no matter how old they get. Getting big Kirsten Dunst and Interview with the Vampire vibes from this. And as for the whole noble woman vibes, yes, this might be the most over-the-top design yet. She's going full gothic Lolita, complete with a giant umbrella, which actually, considering vampires are allergic to sunlight, always carrying an umbrella is kind of a nice touch. And lastly, there's Slayer. Now, at first glance, Slayer might not scream vampire, but I do dig this design. It gives off this aristocratic old money vibe to it, complete with a monocle and a perfectly crafted beard. And vampires need to be charming, they need to be charismatic in order to woo their prey, and Slayer looks like somebody who, if you met at a party, would charm the socks off you. He's the fighting game equivalent of the most interesting man in the world. But as I said earlier, presentation isn't just about their design. It also includes things such as their intro animations. And Slayer begins each fight by sucking the blood from his wife, who is just fine because she has her own crazy backstory that we are not going to get into. Point is, Slayer begins every single round by going full vampire. But we still have to pick a winner, and when you take everything into account, I'd say Dimitri is at the bottom, he's just a tad too basic. Rachel has the interesting immortal take on her design, and the umbrella is a smart addition, so she's up next. But for the winner? I think Mira's classic vampire coloring mixed with her armor that looks regal and elegant while leaning into the bestial nature of vampires makes her just barely squeak out a win over Slayer. And that brings us to their final challenge, the gameplay. Now, I would like to remind everyone we are not talking about how good the characters are, or how much people like to play as them, but how much their gameplay leans into their vampire nature. And to demonstrate what I'm talking about, we'll start with Slayer. 
because this guy is beloved in Guilty Gear. He was great in XR. People want him back in Strive. Slayer is amazing to play as. But does he play like a vampire? Well, all of his moves have swarms of bats flying around, which is great. Even his block is a big bat smoke cloud. And he's got bite which powers him up. That's good stuff. And when he dashes, he vanishes in a cloud of bats. So yeah, he's got a lot of great vampire imagery. But as for the moves themselves, Slayer's specialty lies in his overwhelming strength, not necessarily in being a vampire. I mean, sure, vampires are strong, but I feel like most of his vampirism is sort of just flavor added on top of all of his crazy strong punches. Same kind of goes for Rachel. She summons out tons of stuff to fill up the screen, and this includes all kinds of dark, ghastly objects that have a real Halloween-y vibe. But not really a vampire-specific vibe. She actually feels a lot more like a witch to me than a vampire. Next is Mira, and when Mira was turned into a vampire, she was given gauntlets that allow her to fight with her own blood, which she can then turn into a liquid silver material. She can then manipulate that silver to turn into bats, sights, and other gothic imagery. Now, you might be wondering, wait, but aren't vampires weak to silver? I mean, I know that mostly we think of werewolves as being weak to silver, but yes, vampires are weak to silver as well, so when Mira uses this ability, shouldn't it hurt her? That's the fun part. It does. Mira also damages herself with each of her attacks, and you have to gain that life back by sucking your enemy's blood. This is an amazing way of playing into her backstory while being loaded with vampire lore. But let's not count out Dimitri just yet, and no count was not a pun there. He's got fiery bat projectiles, a spin attack where he hits you with his cape that turns into wings, he can teleport, which is reminiscent of how vampires can turn into mist to travel around, he's got tons of moves that match classic vampire powers. But he's got one that puts him over the top. Yes, that's right, we're talking about the Midnight Bliss. I know this move has been memed and made fun of to high heaven, and it's understandably why, but it's actually kind of the perfect super move for a vampire. Because I mentioned that vampires are charismatic, but that's because they have hypnotic powers. And classically, male vampires manipulate women using their powers to court them, then they suck their blood and turn them into their slaves. Yeah, just really evil stuff. And in Midnight Bliss, Dimitri comes over to you with a rose in order to court you, transforms you into his personalized slave, then he turns into a demon and sucks your blood dry. So not only does this fit the hypnotic power and the enslavement and the blood drinking, but this is also the only vampire on our list who we see actually turning into a beast, another classic vampire power. So in the end, I'd say Rachel comes in last, then Slayer, and then if we were just looking at special moves, I would put Mira at the top. But how unique Midnight Bliss is while playing into an entire scene from classic vampire literature just barely gets Dimitri in first place. But it doesn't get him in first place overall. Because once we tally up all the votes, we see that Rachel comes in last with 4 points, then Slayer with 7, just barely beating him out is Dimitri with 8, and with 11 points, your winner and queen of the night, Mira. Your life. My blessing. Awesome victory! Now let's move on to the other big ruler of the night, the creature that stalks under the full moon, the werewolf. Now, werewolves aren't nearly as popular as vampires in fighting games, but I was still able to find four solid examples. John Talbane from Darkstalkers, Saberwolf from Killer Instinct, Valkenhayn R. Helsing from Blazeblue, and Yugo from Bloody Roar. Yes, I know he's not technically a werewolf, but I'm still counting it. So let's get to know our canine combatants by starting with their lore. Talbane was a man turned into a werewolf by the curse of his father, the Wolf Lord, metal name right there, but he used martial arts to learn to control the beast inside of him, and even eventually went on to fight and kill his darker half. Then Saberwolf was a wealthy aristocrat who one day discovered that his family used to belong to a clan of monster hunters, only for him to accidentally scratch himself on an old severed werewolf arm, giving him the curse. Now. Okay, admittedly that's kind of a dumb way to get the curse, but from there he spent years experimenting on himself to try and cure his condition, going full mad scientist, and I kind of dig that his backstory murders werewolves, Helsing style monster hunters, and even a dash of Frankenstein. He's like the Universal Monsters starter pack. And speaking of Helsing, get ready for more Blaze Blue Cliff Notes. 
because it's time for Valkenhayn R. Helsing. Valkenhayn was a werewolf who existed outside of reality, essentially meaning he's magic, and even though he was hired to kill the Alucard family, he went on to become their loyal butler. Which doesn't really feel like a point for Valkenhayn, it feels like I should more retroactively give a point to Rachel. But over the years, Valkenhayn would go from being a bloodthirsty and aggressive fighter to being a wise and calm older man, and would even become one of the six legendary heroes who saved the world from a giant rampaging beast. And lastly, Yugo belongs to a race known as Zoanthropes, who have the power to turn into human-animal hybrids. And after fighting to take down a corporation that was experimenting on Zoanthropes, start up an organization designed to bring humans and its people together. Not a bad backstory, but it doesn't really have anything to do with werewolves, so... Yeah, I don't think Hugo's gonna take this one. So Hugo is in last place, but after that I'd put Valkenhayn. He's got some interesting stuff in his origin, and he does work for a family of vampires, and often vampires are seen as controlling other monsters, especially werewolves, so I can give it a few points there. But if we're talking werewolf lore, you knew it was going to come down to Saberwolf or Talbane. And it's a tough call, because I love that Talbane's journey is to overcome his wolf curse, while Saberwolf is a tale about losing yourself to that curse. They kind of mirror each other perfectly. And when it comes to Saberwolf, he does have elements of other classic monsters in him, but rather than taking away from his wolf side, they actually kind of enhance it. But in the end, I think Talbane's martial arts side does add some originality to him, while creating a deeper story with how he had to overcome his curse, and setting him up perfectly for why he would be in a fighting game. So, the winner is Talbane. Next up, presentation, and you'd think there wouldn't be a lot of variety when it comes to werewolves, but as you can see, we've got four very different contenders here. Going from least to most complex, we got Saberwolf. Now, at first glance, he's your basic werewolf. He's just a big, burly canine. But I think they do a great job of conveying his more savage nature. This is definitely the most vicious of our four fighters, and the big snarling mouth and the hunched muscular back, it makes him look like a threat. Then you got Talbane, who is similar to Saberwolf, but he's also a martial artist, so his pants are classic martial arts attire, and he's got a more slender body to match his fighter's agility, and I've gotta give him some extra points because his name is a reference to the father from the classic Wolfman film. That is a really cool little easter egg. But now we get into the more interesting choices. Starting with Hugo, he's just a wolf in Hugo's clothes. Which I get is the point of Blade War. The animal transformations in that game aren't seen as a curse, but more of a power fantasy. Which is totally fine. Transforming into a werewolf as a form of a power fantasy is a part of several interpretations. But now we come to Valkenhayn, and okay, this is a wild one. Because like Hugo, Valkenhayn has two forms, but his standard form is an old butler, while his werewolf side is an actual wolf. Yeah, he goes full-blown transformation. Not only is this original compared to the other characters, but I do love that you can still see some of his human side in his wolf form like the long silver hair running down his back, and the bow in his hair that still wraps around his tail. It's a great touch. So this is a rather hard choice, but I think in last place, and this one hurts to say, but I'm going to have to go with Saberwolf. Yes, I do love how savage he looks. They nailed that. But there isn't a lot beyond that. Then in third place is Yugo. I said that his design plays into the power fantasy side of being a werewolf, which admittedly makes him more teen wolf than werewolf, but Bloody Horror was aimed at a teenage audience, and I think a lot of younger and teen horror fans at some point have had that monster power fantasy about how being the monster could possibly be cool, and Yugo's design does speak to that. Then in second place, I'm going with Valkenhayn, because while I think he's stylish in human form, and I do appreciate that he can also turn into his wolf form, Despite the few hints of his human side in there, I still think his wolf form could be a little bit more interesting. But that leads us to the winner, John Talbane. He keeps the classic wolf design, and he does look plenty savage like Saberwolf, but you can also see the martial arts inspiration in there, which in a way, like Hugo, also speaks to the power fantasy. Now for the final test, gameplay. Starting with the winner of the last round, Talbane uses a nice combination of claw slashes and bites, as well as several moves that show off his martial arts training. Which, as I pointed out, is important because that's how he's able to fight back against his wolf side. Then we got Valkenhayn, who is easily the most unique fighter on this list. I mentioned before that he can change from his human to wolf form, and both forms have completely different attacks, but even when he's in his human form, he's got several moves where his body partially transforms. A very nice touch and something that happens so quickly you might even miss it. And of course, we can't leave out his astral finish, where he slices you apart in front of a full moon. If there is any attack out there that just screams, I'm a werewolf, it's this. And speaking of characters who fight in both human and werewolf forms, 
Yugo. Although sadly, Yugo in wolf form uses about 90% of the same moves as his human form. So you don't really have a werewolf who fights like a werewolf, but instead a werewolf who fights like a boxer. Unlike Saberwolf, the one fighter on this list who goes full wolf. He is all about claws and slashes and bites, and he uses that wolf-like agility of his to get around his opponents and mix them up. And he even has one special where his claw slash is meant to resemble a full moon, making it the perfect special for a lycanthrope. So, I don't think it's any surprise to say Yugo is coming in last. But then, I'm shocked to find myself saying this, but I think Talbane is next. Again, the martial arts stuff is great for how it plays into his backstory, but I feel like even taking that into consideration, his martial art moves could resemble his werewolf nature a little bit more. Now for the final two spots, as cool as Valkenhayn's gameplay is, I have to give the winning spot to Saberwolf. That's because every other character on this list has got some werewolf moves, but then they got some moves that are completely different. Saberwolf is the one character on this list who just fights like a werewolf. Everything about how he moves, how he attacks, it all just leans into what you think of when you think of a werewolf. He even has a move that plays into the uncontrollable savagery of his beast side, as he can activate his killer instinct and just lose control of himself. So if we're just talking about the character that has the best werewolf moveset, it's Saberwolf. But does that make him the best werewolf overall? Well, in last place, I don't think it's going to surprise anyone is Yugo with four points. But then, tied for second and third place, Valkenhayn and Saberwolf both have eight points. I mean, the winner with ten points, the best werewolf in fighting games, the top dog himself, John Talbane. <laughs> Time for our next fire, so how about we dig up everyone's favorite undead combatant, the zombie. In film and television, zombies are typically only dangerous in large numbers. You tend to think of them as a threat when they're taking over the entire world. However, fighting games are one-on-one -on -one battles. Unless it's King of Fighters. Or the Versus games. Listen, the majority of fighting games are one-on-one -on -one battles. So what exactly can you do with a zombie when you can't call up a hundred of his friends? Well, as you'll soon see from our four contenders, quite a lot, actually. From Darkstalkers, there's Lord Raptor, Spinal from Killer Instinct, Squiggly from Skullgirls, and lastly, a character who is so on the nose, there's no way I couldn't include him, Zombie Liu Kang from Mortal Kombat. Yeah, remember when they just straight up turned Liu Kang into a zombie? That was weird, but it's so perfect, how can I not include him? Starting with the lore, Lord Raptor was a famous Australian rock star who died in a plane crash, only to be resurrected by the demon Awesome to act as his personal assassin. However, Raptor being an egotistical hothead jerk decided, screw that, I won't be the Emperor of Hell. So he sucks up to Awesome's face, but then behind his back, he's constantly plotting to overthrow him. Then we got Spinal, who is kind of all over the place. He's been resurrected three different times for three different masters, so his story kind of changes around each time that he's introduced. But the one thing that ties all the different Spinal stories together is that he always used to be a mighty warrior 2,000 years ago, and he found peace in death. But then he was resurrected, and now he's just looking for a way to return to that peace. Zombies are meant to be a distortion of death. It's supposed to be a pained experience. So the idea that this zombie's goal is to return to death is actually pretty good motivation for a zombie. Now Squiggly actually has a lot of lore behind her that ties pretty heavily into the world of Skullgirls. This is a game all about mob families fighting over a sacred artifact, and during one of these mob wars, the daughter of a family of opera singers, Shino Contiero, better known as Squiggly, was killed. However, the Skullgirl has the power to resurrect the dead and enslave them, and Squiggly would have been brought back as a mindless servant for the Skullgirl if it wasn't for one thing. This is also a world full of parasites that grant incredible powers, and Squiggly's family had a very special parasite named Leviathan that bonded with her and kept her from being overtaken. I have to give Squiggly several positive points here, simply for the fact that her origin pretty firmly ties into multiple themes and aspects of the Skullgirls world. And then we come to Zombie Liu Kang, who is just Liu Kang, 
who was killed and then came back as a zombie. Yeah, that's pretty much it. What's that? I need to include more? Uh, sure, I like a challenge. He was resurrected by Raiden after Raiden turned evil, but that plays more into Raiden's lore than zombie Liu Kang's lore. And Liu Kang, when he was alive, did have a lot of backstory. But we're just looking at the lore around his zombie self. And again, there isn't a whole lot here. He died, then Raiden brought him back. And now he's just a zombie. Although, I will give it a positive, because part of the horror of zombies is that there's someone you used to know as a human, now resurrected as a brain-dead ghoul. So in a way, Zombie Liu Kang is actually one of the best zombies in fighting games because he's the only one on this list who we actually knew back when he was alive. So when you look at that rotting mug of his and you feel uneasy, yeah, that's the way you're supposed to feel when you look at a zombie. So yeah, they actually kind of nailed that aspect. He's still coming in last place though. However, when it comes to the first, second, and third spots, that's kind of difficult. These three are close, and it's almost a three-way tie, but we're not doing ties here, so I do have to pick a winner. So I'm going to go with Squiggly in third place, followed by Spinal, because I think that the idea of a zombie that just wants to stay dead is kind of great. And finally, Lord Raptor's personality and the idea of a self-centered death metal rocker now being dead and working for a devil while trying to starscream his way into becoming the new Emperor of Hell it's just too good. There's so much to work with on this character. Next, moving into presentation. Zombie Liu Kang is easily the most basic of these characters. He's just Liu Kang as a zombie. But basic isn't always bad. Sometimes it works. And I think it does here simply because, yeah, this isn't a new character. This is someone who we knew for years as a human. And as I said, part of what makes a zombie creepy is it's someone that you know but now they're a rotting abomination. Plus, the hollow eyes and the chewed off lips give me a real Evil Dead vibe. So you can tell the people that designed this character actually were big horror movie fans. Now, Squiggly on the other hand is probably the most original take on a zombie, at least as far as the characters that we've assembled here today. At first glance, you might not even think of her as a zombie, but when you take a closer look, she actually has a ton going for her. She's got the giant skull on her dress, which is some nice zombie symbolism there, but then she's got that one skeleton hand, her mouth is sewn shut, and her parasite is going straight through her brain, not only because it's trying to keep her from being mind controlled by the skull girl, but also because, yeah, she's a zombie, which means she's a rotting corpse. She's going to have worms crawling through her brain. It might not be pretty, but this is a great touch to her character design. Going back to basic, Spinal originally was a callback to the Ray Harryhausen skeletons from movies like Jason and the Argonauts, but that was it. There wasn't anything else to him. But in the most recent Killer Instinct, they spiced him up a lot. He now looks like an ancient warrior, and I love that he's got a Cthulhu squid shield mixed with parts of a ship wrapped around his body, so you've even got traces of the origin of his death in his design. And finally, there's Lord Raptor, who, if you told me to imagine a rock and roll zombie, yeah, this is the best job you could do with that. He's got the stud pants, the wild hair, he looks stringy and strung out like a lot of old school rockers, but also because, you know, he's dead. And he's got so many small bony parts just jutting out of him, it's perfect. But is it the best? Well, in last place, it would have been Spinal, but man, they really did give him a glow up in the latest game. So he barely beats out Zombie Liu Kang, which leaves us with Squiggly and Raptor. And I'll be honest with you, originally, Lord Raptor was the winner here, simply because if you slap both of these characters up here and said, which one is the better zombie, I'd easily say the one with the skull face and the bone tummy. But as I was writing this script and as I was listing off all the small details on Squiggly, I was really impressed with them. And when you look at all of them combined, yeah, it caused me to change my mind and now Squiggly just barely managed to squeak out a victory here. So things are pretty close and the winner here is going to come entirely down to gameplay. Zombie Liu Kang? Dude, you are only on this list just because you have Zombie in your name. Because your gameplay is just Liu Kang. That's it. 
The only move that Zombie Liu Kang gives in this game that was not part of original recipe Liu Kang's moveset is he has a fatality where he possesses your body? But that's more of a sorcery thing than a zombie thing, so... Yeah, no points. Then Squiggly has a few moves where she plays around with her undead stats, like a super where she buries you in the ground, that's great. And there are a few animations that show her rising up with her arms crossed, making it almost look like she's coming out of a coffin, so that's another good touch. But the vast majority of her moves are related to Leviathan. If I didn't know her origin, if you didn't tell me that she was a zombie, and I just watched some of her gameplay, I don't know if I would say she's a zombie, I might just think that she's someone with a super-powered pet snake. But there is one bit of animation in her gameplay that gets her some major points. When she swaps out with a teammate, she buries herself in the dirt, and her grave just sits there on screen until she comes back out. That's genius! For a zombie in a tag-based fighting game, that's as smart as you can get. Then for Spinal, he creates flaming green skulls around his head, because Mortal Kombat has taught me that green is the color of undead spirits, and he can use them as projectiles which look really damn cool. He can also summon out skeleton arms to attack from the ground, and hey, a skeleton man who attacks with skeletons, sounds good to me. Only problem is that, just like Liu Kang, this feels a little bit more like sorcery or even a ghost type attack than a zombie attack. Zombies to me should lean further into manipulating their own bodies, since they're resurrected corpses. That means that their body is just barely hanging on, so a zombie in a fighting game should take advantage of that, twisting and turning it in all kinds of directions. Which is where Lord Raptor shines. All of his moves are about distorting and contorting his body into different shapes and weapons. Even when he pulls out a weapon, it's a weapon made out of his own body parts. And I also have to point this out, Lord Raptor's moveset is gorgeous. There is so much going on with this animation. There is so much that they do with these sprites to give each of his moves so much life. Okay, I'll admit, that time the pun was intended. So when it comes to gameplay, Liu Kang is in last, Raptor is in first. But second and third place are hard to pick. Spinal definitely has more undead themed attacks, but the few attacks that Squiggly does have, combined with the insane amount of detail in all of her moves that lean into the zombie element, yeah, I gotta put her ahead. Which means our final ranking for the best fighting game zombie goes Zombie Liu Kang at 3 points, then Spinal at 7 points, followed by Squiggly in 2nd place at 9 points, and then at 1st place, Lord Raptor cranks it up to 11 points, making him the best zombie in fighting games. <laughs> Only two categories left, so let's get a little wicked as we ask, who's the best witch in fighting games? Now this is a super vague category, I understand that, because there is a whole lot that can fit under the title, witch. Heck, you can even argue that anybody that uses magic is technically a witch. But remember, we're looking for monsters today, so we're only going to count characters that feel like they fit the more sinister horror versions of witches. And even then, that's still a pretty vague category that can fit a lot in it. Basically, if you use spell books, black cats, cook up spells in a cauldron, or just have a big pointy hat, then I'm going to count you. Your four mistresses of magic are Eno from Guilty Gear, Nine the Phantom from Blaze Blue, Tessa from Red Earth, and Yoriko Yasuzumi from Arcana Hearts. Holy crap, we actually have a category where there isn't a Darkstalkers or Killer Instinct character. Starting with the lore, we've got Eno who. Damn. Yeah, this character might have the craziest backstory of anyone that we're going to talk about today. Hell, I literally talk about fighting game lore for a living, and even I don't know where to start on this. Super Cliff Notes version. During a war with magical robots called Gears, all of mankind wished for someone to save them. A dimension made entirely of magic called the Backyard took these wishes and turned them into a magical focal point. Then it bonded that focal point with a girl that it plucked out of the past. The girl would have turned into a god, but to prevent this, her humanity was removed, thus cutting her powers in half, but also taking away her memories. So, the end result was a super powerful magical rock star witch. She's super cruel, malicious, and has the filthiest mouth of any video game character. And now she uses her time travel powers to screw with the world in order to try and prevent a boring, dull future. I assure you, that is as simple as I could possibly have made that. 
Well, thankfully, I don't have to talk about anyone else confusing, because next up is... ah oh, crap. Right, forgot, Blaze Blue. Okay, Nine the Phantom, Super Hyper Cliff Note Turbo Edition. Nine was one of the most powerful sorcerers on the planet and became one of the six heroes who defeated a giant monster that was destroying the world. Then the world was covered in a poison, so she created a technology that allowed people to survive this poison by turning it into artificial magic, which eventually became the technology that all mankind uses for pretty much everything. She then died only to come back to life a hundred years later as an enslaved puppet, only to then break free of this control, only to then reveal that after all this time she had gone mad. Tessa is a witch who uses science that looks kind of like magic. Yeah, she's kind of cool. Okay, there actually is more in Tessa, but the important thing is that she's entirely focused on the pursuit of knowledge, to the point of being rather extreme sometimes. And lastly, there is Yoriko Yasuzumi from Arcana Hearts. Who thought that when this video started, you would see a character from Arcana Hearts on here? Not me. And I wrote this thing. But after researching it, yeah, Yoriko actually deserves to be a contender. She used to be a shy bookworm who was obsessed with the occult, so okay, occult is certainly very witchy. But then her friend Lilica pulled a prank on her, causing her to summon out a demon who then forced Yoriko into a contract. Yoriko, I don't think Lilica is your friend and you should not be hanging out with her anymore. Now aside from just being a really bad situation for poor Yoriko, this is some textbook witch behavior. If you know your supernatural lore, the classic myth about witches is that they're the brides of Satan, meaning they've entered into some kind of a contract with them. Well, thankfully, this isn't as creepy as that, but Yoriko is in a contract now with a demon, Meaning, out of all these contenders, she's the only one following Classic Witch Protocol. So, where does everyone land on our spooky tier list? At the bottom, Tessa. I mean, not only is there not a lot to her backstory, but I know someone has already been screaming this the entire time. Yes, technically Tessa isn't even a witch. She's a sorcerologist, which means that she's someone who uses science like it's magic. So yes, I should probably not count her, but if you ask me if it looks like magic, if it sounds like magic, if it's cast like magic, if it hits like magic, I still say it's magic. So I am going to count her as a witch, but yeah, you can't deny that her being a sorcerologist is kind of a big strike against her. Then, ooh, this is going to be another unpopular opinion. But I have to go with Eno. Listen, I love Eno, she's one of my favorite Guilty Gear characters, but just talking about her lore, I do love her personality, super cruel and manipulative, which is great classic evil witch behavior, and also being the creation of the focal point of the largest spell ever cast is a pretty good origin for a witch. But after that, she's 90% a time-traveling chaos agent. If she didn't have the witch hat, you probably wouldn't even consider her for this list. Yoriko, on the other hand, yeah, as I said, girl who gets into the occult until getting trapped into a contract with a demon? That's a perfect witch origin. And her personality, combined with the fact that she didn't sign the devil deal intentionally, does keep her from being too basic. But if we're talking about the big winner here, it has to be Nine the Phantom. Super powerful sorcerer hero who actually invents a way for all of mankind to use artificial magic? That makes her basically the patron saint of sorcery only to then die and then come back evil with her mind twisted? Yeah, you want to talk about Queen of Witches stuff? That's it right there. So, now we know why these characters can cast spells, so let's see how well they can do it. Let's look at the gameplay. And Tessa might have been the big loser for the last match, but she is already off to a strong start here. She specializes in ice attacks, but can also summon out dragons, ghosts, doves, and special props like she's a stage magician, and she can even have her cats attack, and what is a witch without cats? The amount of variety in her attacks and how many supernatural and witchy references are in these moves is crazy. Next up, Eno. Again, have to stress this, I do love Eno, she's a great character, but her moveset is decidedly not very witchy. She attacks with musical specials, which does play into her rock and roll theme, but nothing there really screams witch. Yes, she does use magic, but this is Guilty Gear, a world where magic replaced technology, so technically everyone uses magic. I will say that her original instant kill does show her rocking out with the demonic band, and that's a great merger of the witch and rock and roll tropes. But she does lose that instant kill in the next game, and it never comes back, sadly. Then Yoriko mostly just attacks with her staff, which is possessed by her demon pal Mike. I mean, okay, 
She is attacking you with the demon she made the deal with, so I guess that gets you some points? But she doesn't have a lot of actual spells at her disposal. She does have a few for her big supers, but there could have been some more magical stuff in there. But then we come to Nine, and Nine actually has one of my favorite movesets in any fighting game. Because in Blaze Blue, you have three basic attacks and a drive button, which is a unique ability for every single character. Well, each of Nine's three attacks are based around different elements, and whenever she does one of these attacks, she gains a charge. And when you press her drive button, she performs a special attack based around whatever the last three charges are that you built up. So not only does she use the elements, a super witchy thing to do since many witches are based around nature, but she is literally using her attacks as ingredients for her drive ability. Meaning she is making a witch's brew out of her attacks as she fights. That is maybe the smartest way to implement a witch's power into a fighting game that I have ever seen. Nine is the clear winner, followed by Tessa, then Yoriko, and lastly, Eno. Sorry, Eno. And that just leaves the presentation. Starting again with the loser of the last match, Eno is super fashionable. But not necessarily in a way that says witch. There are small details here and there, like how her duster can resemble a witch's cape, but real talk, for Eno's design, it's all about that hat. And don't get me wrong, it is a great hat. It's got eyes and jagged teeth and it spits out musical notes. It is easily the best hat on this list. But I don't know how far that hat alone is going to carry her. Then Yoriko, she's got the classic witch hat and the pointy shoes, and I dig that her clothes are too big for her, lean into the fact that she doesn't really know what she's doing and she's in way over her head. Also, I love that the cape is alive and it forms into hands to imply that it's being controlled by the demon. And of course, there's the staff with the giant demon cat head. You see that and you instantly know something ain't right with her. Tessa? This is probably the most basic standard witch design on the list, but I do give it some points for the cape looking like dragon claws and wings. Dragons are often linked with witches, so that does work. And then nine... Damn, I didn't mean for this just to be the Nine the Phantom show, but this look is amazing. She's got the witch hat and the cape, but they're both burned and cut, and that mixed with the wild hair and her black eyes gives off this feeling like she just climbed her way back out of hell. And the rest of the design with her heels and the striking red streaks and the purple dress give off a more sinister vibe, and when you know her backstory, yeah, all that fits together way too well. So, the winners for best witch designs go to Yoriko. It's good, but kind of basic. Tessa, again, very basic, but the dragon wing cape is a great touch. Eno, yes, I know I said that she doesn't really have much going on besides the witch hat, but that witch hat did go a long way. If you told me to picture a rock and roll witch, yeah, this design fits. And then in first place is Nine the Phantom, because no duh. Meaning, your winner is Nine the Phantom with a clean sweep of 12 points, and then in a three-way tie for second place... Tessa, Yoriko, and Eno, all of whom came out with six points each. Meaning for the witches category, we actually have a score of six, six, six. No, I did not plan that. I am just as surprised as you are, and I'm a little bit creeped out. So let's go ahead and give Nine her prize because I think I need to call a priest. And that brings us to our final category, the most ancient of monsters, the most primal of man's fears, Ghost. Again, another tough category. This might be second only to vampires for monster types with the most representation. There were some strong spirits who sadly couldn't make the cut. And for all the sticklers out there, I'll go ahead and warn you, I'm counting cursed artifacts and spirits as ghosts, so don't get all well actually on me about this. We all know what I mean when I say ghost. If you would have a page dedicated to you in the Tobin Spirit Guide, you count. So let's go ahead and summon up our four contestants, Bishamon from Darkstalkers, Hisako from Killer Instinct, Kusa Regido from Samurai Showdown, and Zappa from Guilty Gear. Starting with the lore, and thankfully after the witches, this one is going to be much simpler. Bishamon was a man who bought a cursed set of armor and a sword, which slowly drove him insane until it consumed him. 
Hisako lived 400 years ago, and when her father was killed by invading soldiers, she picked up her weapon and took revenge on the killers. A shrine was erected to her, but when the evil company Ultratech destroyed her shrine, she came back as an Onryo with a grudge and looking for revenge once again. Kuzurikido was once a kind man who unfortunately was put into a situation where he was forced to commit cannibalism, and sadly this sin didn't save his life for long. And when he died, he was transformed into a Gaki, a hungry ghost. Now he roams the land looking only to feed. And lastly, Zappa is a young man who studied the paranormal only to end up getting possessed by multiple ghosts. Basically, imagine if Zack Baggins ended a season of Ghost Adventures on the greatest cliffhanger ever. Zappa has no idea that he's possessed though. He just believes that he passes out without warning and then he wakes up covered in bruises and now he's searching for a way to cure his bizarre sleepwalking. All good spooky stories, so it was really hard to pick any kind of an order on this one, but I think in last place I'm going to have to go with Bishamon. The story of him slowly being driven mad by the cursed armor is creepy, but I just felt like all the other stories had a little bit more to it. Then Hisako, she's basically your classic Onryo, a grudge ghost for anyone who's not caught up on their paranormal spirits, but I dig that her story is tied into the big evil company behind Killer Instinct. The fact that she's a grudge ghost, whose grudge is specifically against Ultratech, is a nice blend of the ghost myth and the game's story. In second place, Kuzurugito. It's a tragic story and the whole cannibalism angle is extra creepy, and one detail that I left out is that at the end of the game, Kuzurugito meets his daughter once again, and he eats her because he is consumed by uncontrollable hunger. I don't think we're going to get anything creepier in this entire video. That scene is one of the most disturbing things in any fighting game. Which means in first place is Zappa. The idea of a fighting game character who is possessed so they don't realize that they're getting into these fights, they just wake up with the injuries from these fights and doesn't know how they got them, is super unique. And Zappa is a good dude, you feel so bad for him being possessed. But at the same time, the fact that a paranormal investigator is possessed by multiple ghosts and doesn't realize it, is a great bit of dark humor. But what gets him up to the number one spot is, well simply it's unfair. The other three contenders are one ghost each. Zappa is possessed by multiple ghosts and each of them have a little bit of lore behind them. In the end, it's kind of just a numbers game. On to presentation, and for this one, I just want to remind everyone, presentation does not apply to their moveset. Had to point that out again because the line between presentation and moveset really starts to blur on some of these. Bijamon. He's good for what he is. He's a cursed suit of armor with a monster face on his belly, and he's got a big, twisted, angry, vengeful face. This is exactly what a man in a cursed suit of armor would look like. Hisako. She's the grudge ghost. She's the ring girl but I dig the contrast between her pale skin and her red kimono, which you could say is meant to reflect all the people that she murdered in life. And I love that her body is constantly twitching and flickering like she doesn't quite exist within our world. And as I said earlier, the intro and victory animation does count for presentation, and the fact that she actually gives you a jump scare before your match, oh, that's perfect. Then we go to Kusurugito, who is certainly creepy, I mean, you see that thing and you just start praying to every deity that you can think of. And the giant smiling face is so disturbing and great for a ghost that's obsessed with eating. And lastly, Zappa. What the hell is Zappa wearing? Listen, whether you think he looks good or not, that's not ghost attire. That's a JoJo character. Although again, we are counting the intro animations, and the animation on Zappa getting possessed and his body cracking apart... Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. But not good enough to save him from the bomb of this list. Zappa, I'm sorry, but that outfit just does not say Ghost in any way, shape, or form. I did consider counting the individual designs of each of the ghosts that are possessing him, and that would have given him some more points, but in the end, I decided that since they only come out during the match, I'm going to count that as gameplay. Then Bijamon. This look is good, but it doesn't quite go far beyond just being good. Then Kuzurugito. Super creepy, super freaky, but I feel like they could have done maybe one more thing with it. I feel like it's just missing that certain special thing. And in first place, Hisako. 
This perfectly captures the Onryo design while still giving it colors that pop. And I love the pose, that look of being so withered and twisted that she has to lean on her Naginata at all times just to stand up. Along with how she's constantly distorting as she just exists within this world. I feel like any other game that tried to put an Onryo into their cast would have just gone, yeah, long haired gray girl. But Hisako does so much with this idea. So the scores are now tightening up, which means that the final round will decide it all. The gameplay. Starting again with the last round's loser, Zappa is about to turn things all around in this matchup because he is wall to wall nightmare fuel. I already mentioned that in his intro animation, he does crack his body apart when he becomes possessed. And he doesn't go back to normal when the match begins. Throughout the entire fight, he is walking around with his body twisted and distorted. It's like he's doing the exorcism crab walk throughout the entire match. Then each of his normals involve ghosts popping out and attacking you, whether it be springing from his body or mutating him into something horrific. For his specials, he can summon out various ghosts to assist him, whether it be a pack of three straight jagged ghosts, a shadowy dog, a haunted sword, or a demon of lightning. And as for his instant kill? He just flat out makes you watch the ring tape. He may be up first, but Zappa is already going to be tough to beat. Bijamon's gameplay largely leans into his Samurai Ronin armor, as most of his moves come from his sword, but he can still summon out spirits to stun the opponent, grab you with a giant ghost hand, and even create multiple ghost spirits to chop you down. Great stuff for a spooky haunted armor. Then we go to Kusurugito, who does have a few ghostly specials, but Sam Show is a weapon-based fighting game. So, what's Kusurugito's weapon? His own sharpened bone on an arm that he has already eaten the flesh off of. Oh, that's gotta be one of the creepiest weapons of all time. And we have to mention his finishing move, where he picks you up, slams you off screen, and then proceeds to eat you. You might hear the phrase, hungry ghost, and think it doesn't sound serious. This moveset makes you rethink that. And finally, Hisako. First up, her walk cycle. She crawls around on twisted, broken limbs with a scuttering sound over the whole thing. This is the perfect walk cycle for an Onryo. Then she's got teleports because all ghosts need a jump scare in their moveset. And she can suck her opponent in with a ghostly whale to possess them and twist their body around. Very smart idea to give a ghost an actual possession move, and yet Hisako is the only one on this list to have one. However, outside of this, most of Hisako's attacks all revolve around using her giant Naginata. So where is she going to land? Well, I don't think it's any surprise, but Zappa is our winner this time. And sadly, I think I have to put Bishamon at the bottom. He just needed more ghost moves. So who is in second and who is in third? Well, just going solely by the moves themselves, I think Kusurugito is better. He definitely has more creepy attacks, more things that play into his ghost nature, but... Damn, that walk cycle on Hisako is one of the best ways to animate a ghost. Not just in fighting games, but in any game in general. And because of that, I think she just barely squeaks ahead of the hungry, hungry yokai. Which means your final scores are Bishamon with 4 points, Kusurugito with 8, and then... Oh. This hasn't happened yet. It's a tie. Hisako and Zappa both have 9 points. Which means we have to go into the tiebreaker. And to settle this, we're going to match up Zappa and Hisako, and we're going to ask, who has the better theme? Yeah, I was tempted to judge all these characters on themes, as well as just making it part of the presentation category, but not every character has their own theme, so I felt like it would be unfair. Luckily, Zappa and Hisako both have their own tracks, so let's see who has the most ghostly tunes. Now, Zappa is from Guilty Gear, a game that is known for its hard rock, and Zappa's theme certainly matches that, but also a bit heavier. It feels like a song that's pressing down on you, as if to match how tortured Zappa is. And I can't quite put my finger on it, but it almost feels a bit operatic to me. As if I could picture someone singing this in a big gothic hall, while still being loaded with all that super hard 80s and 90s rock that this series is known for. So, not bad, not bad. But Hisako's theme, on the other hand... Yeah, this isn't just the better of these two themes, this is arguably the best spooky theme in any fighting game. 
Again, it's got a heavy rock theme to it, but the notes hit you in a way that makes it feel like something is breaking through. Like you can feel the lights flickering and the walls cracking around you as Hisako makes her way into the land of the living. Then there's the chanting that gives off a ritualistic aura, and at one point it all fades away and the music just becomes a woman crying and children singing, and that's just horror movie sounds 101 right there. Even if you don't play Killer Instinct, even if you don't play fighting games at all, this is just an amazing song to put on to get you into the Halloween spirit. So now that we've listened to these, we can declare our winner and say that the ghost with the most is Hisako. Supreme victory! And there you have it, folks. We set out to see if Darkstalkers did indeed have the best monsters in fine games, and in the end, they did have a solid chunk of contenders. But we also saw that Killer Instinct has plenty of worthy combat creatures. And even Skullgirls, Blaze Blue, Guilty Gear, and more could step up. So what I'm saying is that if you're like me and you love Darkstalkers and you miss having a whole game full of fighting monsters, then go out there and explore. There's plenty of games with rosters full of grappling ghouls and brawling beasts to suit your taste. But now that we've tallied up all of my votes and you see how I feel about all this, let me know your thoughts. Do you agree with my decisions? Do you think I missed some contenders who should have been on this list? Would you like us to do this again? I'm not even talking about another monsters list next Halloween. This is a brand new idea for this channel, and there's plenty of other fine game tropes that we could compare. Best protagonists, best bosses, best rivals. This could be a regular show if you guys are on board. Let me know all that and more in the comments down below or on Twitter at Thorgies Arcade. Thank you again for tuning in, everyone. Stay safe out there, and happy Halloween. <laughs>